Part three of this video series focuses on pressure reducing valves, PRVs. Do not confuse pressure reducing valves, those are PRVs, with PRDs, pressure restriction devices. As explained in part two in this series, pressure restriction devices, PRDs, are found on conventional standpipe outlets seen here on the left that are identified by their threaded valve stem. This distinguishes them from PRVs, pressure reducing valves seen here on the right, which have a smooth stem. After viewing this video, viewers will understand the purpose for PRVs and how they function. Understanding PRVs requires an understanding of NFPA 14, the standard for installation of standpipe and hose systems. Here, Miami-Dade fire prevention inspectors are examining plans and witnessing a flow test to ensure that the standpipe system in this newly constructed high-rise building is in compliance with NFPA 14. NFPA 14 requires standpipe outlets to flow a minimum of 250 gallons a minute and at a minimum residual or flow pressure of 100 PSI. NFPA 14 limits hose outlet static pressure, that's with no water flowing, and residual pressure with water flowing to a maximum pressure of 175 PSI. This becomes problematic in tall buildings because of elevation or head pressure. We learned in basic hydraulics, it requires 0.434 PSI to lift a column of water one foot. Accordingly, the pressure at the base of a column of water one foot high is 0.434 PSI. To simplify hydraulic calculations, we round 0.434 to 0.5 PSI. And to further simplify things, we'll assume that the height of floors in older residential buildings are generally 10 foot from floor slab to floor slab. Hence, 10 foot of height times 0.5 PSI for elevation equals 5 PSI, or 5 PSI of elevation loss per floor. Now consider a 10-story building. If the building was exactly 100 foot high, that would be 100 feet of elevation times 0.5 PSI. That would be 50 PSI of head pressure at the base of the riser. Another way of calculating elevation loss is take the number of floors, in this case 10, times 5 PSI per floor. The answer is the same, 50 PSI of head pressure at the base of the riser. Additionally, the height of floors in office buildings as well as new residential buildings are generally 12 foot or higher as a result. We calculate the head pressure or elevation loss as 6 PSI per floor. Now consider a modern 30-story residential or office building. The calculation would be 30 floors times 6 PSI per floor would equal a head pressure of 180 PSI at the base of its standpipe risers. There is a one-way check valve between the fire department connection, the FDC, and the base of the risers. If an engine was to pump 150 PSI into the fire department connection, it would fail to push open the check valve. The engine would have to increase its discharge pressure to over 180 PSI in order to force open the check valve and get water in the system, even if the fire was on a lower floor. Now let's take it a step further. NFPA 14 requires that a standpipe flow 500 gallons per minute from two outlets, typically on the roof, and 250 gallons per minute from one outlet on each additional standpipe for a total of 1,000 gallons per minute for sprinklered and 1,250 gallons per minute for non-sprinklered buildings. Consider our 30-story building has two standpipes, one for each stairwell. The fire pump in the building does not know 
what story the fire is on. It only knows one pressure, the pressure necessary to lift 750 gallons per minute to the roof and discharge it at a minimum of 100 PSI. Now, without calculating the friction loss in the system, the fire pump would have to develop 180 PSI to overcome the elevation plus 100 PSI for the outlet flow pressure on the roof. That's 280 PSI at the base of its standpipe risers. Herein lies the problem. Remember, NFPA 14 sets the maximum outlet pressure at 175 PSI. There has to be a way to reduce outlet pressures to a maximum of 175 PSI. Hence, the reason for PRVs. There are two basic types of PRVs, factory set and field adjustable. Both types reduce both static and residual or flow pressure with a floating piston and plunger assembly. Note that this assembly is not connected to the valve wheel. It is as if the piston and plunger, which are attached to each other and move in unison, have a mind of their own, moving in response to pressure downstream of the outlet. In both factory set and field adjustable PRVs, water downstream enters a hole in the valve stem, travels up a waterway to fill an upper chamber. Pressure in the upper chamber acts upon the piston, pushing it down, closing the valve, or partially closing the valve. This is why we cannot pump into first floor PRV outlets as if they were inlets in the event of a faulty fire department connection. Water would enter the outlet, travel up the waterway, fill the upper chamber, and push the piston plunger assembly closed, cutting the flow of water as if it was a check valve. In the rare event that the fire department connections are damaged and the first floor standpipe outlets are PRVs, the only course of action is to pump hose lines into the building's fire pump test connection. This requires someone to enter the fire pump room and open the valve for the test connection. The pressure reducing properties of a factory set valve depends on the surface area of the piston. PRVs on lower floors, where pressures are greater, tend to have larger pistons than PRVs on upper floors, where there are lower pressures. The higher in the building, the lower the head pressure. Hence, it is not uncommon to find conventional outlets on uppermost floors where system pressures do not exceed 175 PSI. Field adjustable PRVs can be adjusted by suppression system contractor or firefighters by increasing or reducing the tension in a large spring. Note that the piston of a field adjustable PRV is massive compared to factory set valves. Increasing the tension in the spring on this valve with a 1 in 1 16th inch socket and these valves with a steel rod work against the piston to keep the valve open at higher pressures. 